I want to invite you to open up in your Old Testament to Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1. Have you ever noticed that people tend to be fascinated with ruins? There are people who spend a lot of money and they travel around the world and they do that so that they can look at structures that have fallen apart at some point. There are no tell, there's no telling how many people in a year's time, for example, will visit the Acropolis in Athens, Greece, the site of the Parthenon. And for years, people have traveled thousands of miles merely to see the ruins of what was once a spectacular structure. And of course, the tourist people in Greece know that people love ruins and they make it you know, easy and easy for you to spend your money there. In our lesson this evening, we're going to see that God maybe has a little bit of a different attitude about ruins. He's not nearly as enamored with them as people are today. And in fact, what we're going to find is that he would rather build than go sightseeing through the ruins. And even when we begin to talk in, <coughs> excuse me, in New Testament terms, Peter would say in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5 that, that we, like living stones, are being built up, he says, into a spiritual house. God's interested in building. And the truth is that, that many churches and even the lives of many individuals are basically lying in ruins. And the sad thing about all of that is that people have actually become accustomed to that sort of thing. Um, they, they're content living with the way things are. And, and so many times survival has replaced revival as the plan for the future. And what I want us to see this evening is that there are many ways in which we can be engaged in, in building uh, the Lord doesn't want us merely to have a, a survival mentality. He doesn't want us to say, well, we're not doing all that we can do, but at least we're, you know, we're kind of hanging in there. He desires and he even expects a great deal more from us than that. And I hope what we can do is kind of lay a foundation tonight that is, you know, that we see in the, the life of one of God's great builders, Nehemiah. When Nehemiah first arrived in Jerusalem, the, the walls around the city were still in ruins. Uh, they had been knocked down during the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. And uh, the people of Judah had been taken, of course, into captivity at that time. <clears throat> and the book of Nehemiah is the story of a man who built up the people of God by returning uh, to Jerusalem to build up the walls around the city of God. And Nehemiah wasn't among the first of the exiles to return to Judah. In fact, he's far from it. Uh, he wasn't even you know, alive when the people began making their way back to Judah from the captivity. There was a period of about 100 years between the time of the first exiles and their return and the time that Nehemiah made his way to Jerusalem. And the point in his life that we're going to look at this evening was really before he ever stepped foot in the city of Jerusalem, when he was functioning as the cupbearer of King Artaxerxes in Susa, which was the capital of the Persian Empire. But it's obvious from what is said in the opening words of this book that he still had a great love for the city of Jerusalem. And so I want us to begin there in Nehemiah chapter 1 and start in verse 1. It says, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, now it happened in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. And as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven, Nehemiah says. We'll go ahead and stop there for now. As we begin tonight, let me ask you this. Why was Nehemiah so concerned about the way things were in Jerusalem? I mean, he doesn't live there. It's not really, you know, his business in some sense of that expression. What's, what's going on in his heart and in his mind? And I want to suggest a couple of things that I think are critical to understanding Nehemiah and understanding his concern. And the first of those, I want to suggest to you that Nehemiah understood that the city of Jerusalem, that it said something about the God of Israel, and that was what was important to him. And so what's significant about the city of Jerusalem? What was it known for? 
It was known for being the dwelling place of God, was it not? You read in Psalm 135 and verse 21, Blessed be the Lord from Zion who dwells in Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. And that fact is stated in a number of different ways in a number of different passages in the Old Testament. It was well known, of course, among the people. In Psalm 76, in the first couple of verses, in Judah, God is known. His name is great in Israel. His abode has been established in Salem, his dwelling place in Zion. Well, Salem's just the shortened form of Jerusalem. And Zion is the name of the mountain in Jerusalem upon which the temple sat. And it was the Lord's dwelling place. In fact, I suppose you could even go so far as to say that, that for an Israelite to talk about Zion was for all practical purposes to talk about God. In Psalm 137, in the first few verses of that psalm, when the, when the people were in captivity, it says in verse 1, By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept. When we remembered Zion, on the willows there we hung up our lyres. For there our captors required of us songs and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? To sing a song of Zion is to sing the Lord's song. And it would have been difficult for the Israelites to, to think about their God without also thinking about Jerusalem. And it would have been impossible for them to think about Jerusalem without thinking about their God. And Nehemiah understood that since Jerusalem was God's dwelling place, the glory of Jerusalem reflected the glory of God. And he was troubled because of, the great concern for the, because of his great concern for the reputation of the God he served. The city of Jerusalem and the God of Israel were inseparably connected in people's minds. And you couldn't, you couldn't separate the city of Jerusalem from the things of God. And when the people of other nations said things like, who is the God of Israel and, and where is his home? The Israelites at this point in time had to point to a place with torn down walls and burnt gates. And I'm sure the people from those pagan nations must have thought, what kind of God must he be if this is the best he can do for a home? And I wouldn't be surprised if that was Nehemiah's concern. When he received the report about Jerusalem, he knew immediately that it was a disgrace to the reputation of God. He understood that God is not honored by ruins. But I also want to suggest that Nehemiah understood that the wall around Jerusalem said something about the people of Israel, the people of God. When Nehemiah heard that the wall around Jerusalem was broken down, that its gates had been burned, it says in verse 4 of our text, he sat down and wept and mourned for days. You ever wondered why he's so upset? Was it just because he thought about the walls there and the, the city gates? I don't think so. His real concern wasn't for the condition of the wall or the gates. His concern was for the people. After all those years, again, we're, we're talking about, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of a century at this point. They are still living like exiles. They had grown accustomed to life without walls. And they had, and they had settled for a, a survival mentality instead of adopting a revival mentality. And that's why Nehemiah's aim when he went to Jerusalem wasn't primarily, you know, let's get busy and let's start putting things into place. It's not a construction project. It was a consecration project. He didn't go to Jerusalem just to build up a wall. He went to build up a people. And his concern, of course, sparked a revival among the people of God. Now, now, let me ask you this. Are you ever troubled by the ruins that you see around you? W would you like to see revival in our time? You know, that word just has to do with coming to life again, springing to life again. I'd like to point out some things that are necessary in order for that, for that to happen. Three essentials for revival that we see in this text. And, and the first of those, in order for there to be a revival, there needs to be a people who care. You need to have people who care. We need to be like Nehemiah. He cared about what was going on in the city of Jerusalem. He was genu genuinely concerned when he heard about the condition of the city. And we have to ask ourselves sometimes, are we ever troubled by the way things are? I, I ran across a quote one time that said, some church people are too dignified to have broken hearts. Is that true? Do we not mourn over the, things, the way things are at times? I don't think we can ever accomplish what the Lord wants us to accomplish unless our hearts are broken by the same things that break the heart of God. 
When we see people, uh, people start caring about the lost and caring about the weak as much as God cares about the lost and the weak, then we'll find a way to do what we need to do to help them. When we, when we are people who, who have that kind of approach to life, doesn't that just make sense? When we're genuinely concerned about the things God is concerned about, how could we not do something about it? And, of course, the opposite of that is also true. If we don't care about the things that God cares about, then, of course, we're not going to really do them. We're going to find something else to do with our time. We'll, we'll, we'll get together and we'll survive, but there won't be revival. The only foundation God can build on, as one writer said, is a soft heart. And that's true. Revival begins with the people who care. But second, in order for there to be revival, there also needs to be what we find in this, in this chapter is a commitment to prayer. When Nehemiah received word about the condition of Jerusalem, look at what he says there again in, in chapter 1 and verse 4. He says, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Tell you what, my personal conviction is that one of the greatest needs in our day is for us to learn how to pray like the many great examples we find in Scripture, like Nehemiah, for one. From what is said in the text, it seems that he spent days in prayer. But let me ask you, when was the last time you heard of a church praying for days about anything? Have you ever heard of a church or an individual doing something like that? You know, that's not, really, that's not really how we get things done in the 21st century, is it? When we, we see a problem, we immediately want to get together and we want to talk about it. And we may begin with an opening prayer. It may take about 30 seconds, maybe a minute or two at the most. But then we talk for hours about how we plan to fix the problem. Isn't that how you do it in the 21st century? It makes me wonder sometimes if we truly believe in the God that, that, that we appeal to and the God who has said that he will, he will be there for his people. I read a story a while back that I'm just going to tell you, I, I find it funny. In some ways, it's not really all that funny. But as far as I know, this is a true story that I'm about to tell you. There was a, a man who wanted to build a tavern in a small southern town, a, a bar. And this little town had never had an establishment like that. And the local church people, quote unquote, were very upset about this. And they began to pray that he wouldn't be able to open his business in their town. Well, they didn't succeed. Didn't stop him from opening his business. But two days after this bar opened in town, there was a storm and lightning struck it and it burned to the ground. And so the church folks were pleased by that until they found out that the owner of the tavern hired a lawyer and wanted to sue them for it. And the church responded in turn and said, well, we, they hired a lawyer, and uh, they just denied the whole thing. This is not our doing. We didn't have anything to do with this, you know, not our fault. And at the preliminary hearing, the judge made this observation. He said, I don't, I don't know what I'll decide, he said, but it seems to me that the tavern owner believes more in the power of prayer than the church does, you know. That's kind of pitiful, isn't it? Do we really believe in the power of prayer? I don't think we ought to expect the Lord to bring about any kind of revival among his people until we're serious about appealing to him to do just that. He will do that to, when his people get serious about pouring out their hearts to him, hearts that are concerned about the way things are. We have to be people who care, and we must have this kind of commitment that we see in Nehemiah to being a praying people. Third, in order for there to be a revival, there needs to be what I'm going to call a willingness to dare because I wanted everything to rhyme. You could probably say it a different way, but I'm going to say it this way. And it may not be immediately obvious what I mean by that, but I hope you'll see in just a moment. Nehemiah couldn't do anything where he was. He's in Susa. I don't know how many hundreds of miles that is away, uh, but it's a, a, a good distance. And it didn't matter how concerned he was about what was going on in Jerusalem, and in, and in some sense of the expression, how much he might have prayed for their situation, he wasn't going to accomplish anything to help them without a willingness to leave his comfortable position as the cupbearer of Artaxerxes and to go do something about it. If we're ever going to do some great work for God, or any work for God, actually, we'll only do so because we've decided that we're willing to move beyond what is easy for us. 
Many people would like to accomplish something for the Lord. There's no doubt in my mind about that. But there aren't many people who are willing to leave their comfort zone in order to do that. If it can fit within my plans and what I want to do and in my comfort level, then absolutely sign me up. I, you know, and I might get you know, slightly out of it. Maybe, maybe I'll be willing to you know, teach the three-year-olds or something. I mean, you know, if you're just feeling crazy at some point. But on the whole, we don't really want to get out of our comfort zone. What we need to see is that we have to be people who care and who pray to God. And then in light of that, who are willing to be used by him. Even if that means that our lives are going to get uncomfortable in the process. We have to. When, when you look at somebody like the Apostle Paul, you, you think he looked at situations and said, you know what? I, I really like to further the kingdom, but I, I want this to be an easy sort of thing. Uh, maybe I can write letters to people. He did that. But he did a lot more than that. And when you look at the other servants of God, whether you're talking about the Old Testament or the New Testament, one thing you will find as you read through scriptures is that if you are willing to be used by God for his purposes, your comfort level is not his primary concern. His glory is. And he has used people time and time again to bring glory to him, who have brought glory to him. Have done so through great cost to themselves. So we bring things to a close this evening. Now I want to point out a, a couple of principles just quickly that I think are, are taught in the book of Nehemiah about building rather than living with the ruins. And so just a couple of principles for us as we wrap things up. And the first of those is that our passion must be for people more than for projects. You know, sometimes what we want to do is we just want a good project. And we don't necessarily, you know, we want to help people but the project's all important. And I believe we're greatly, uh, we greatly misunderstand Nehemiah. If we believe that his concern was you know, just for the city of Jerusalem and the wall around it and its gates, his concern was for the state of the people. And so the book of Nehemiah is not so much about rebuilding walls as it is rebuilding a nation. That's what Nehemiah was concerned about. And what that says is before we go on in our work for the Lord, we have to decide why we're doing that. Why do we want to engage in this? You know, it's possible to go about that work because, you know, we want to pad the stats, so to speak. We want to fill up a building. It's possible to take that approach. And what it needs to be is that we are concerned about people and we don't want to see their lives in ruin. That needs to be the motivation. And if that's not our motivation, we need to take another look at the things that we are doing. But the second principle is this. Our concern must be for consecration more than for construction. Again, the problem in Jerusalem really didn't have anything to do with the condition of the walls. It, that was a symptom of the problem. The problem in Jerusalem was the condition of the inhabitants. And, and so Nehemiah wasn't concerned about getting the children of Israel involved in some kind of activity just so they could be doing something. He was concerned about their devotion to God. That's what he wanted. He wanted them to be committed. And again, when we talk about doing the Lord's work, why do we talk about it? Do we talk about it simply so that we can be busy, you know, again, doing something? Or do we talk about working for the Lord because it comes from hearts that are consecrated, hearts that are devoted to him? There's a difference between those two things. The Apostle Paul would say in Romans chapter 15 and verse 4 that whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. And what that means is that when we look at books like Nehemiah, we're meant to learn something from them. We're to get something out of them. And I hope that we can learn what the Lord wants us to learn from the, the examples of, of great men like Nehemiah who teach us that God is going to be there for his people, always has. And he will help us all along the way. But that if he is going to do that, it is because we are all in. No holding back, no kicking back sitting there waiting on him, but people who say, Lord, I see the way things are, and I don't want them to be that way, and I'm going to appeal to you, and then I'm going to let you use me to accomplish your purposes. That's what we have to be willing to do. 
Are you ready for that? Are you all in on that? It's what it takes for there to be revival. If you're here tonight, maybe we have some of the audience who have never obeyed the gospel of Christ. I tell you what, that is a, a great thing to do and a great thing to do tonight if you've never done it. If you, if you know that Jesus is the, the Christ, the Son of God, you believe that. And you know that from what you have read in Scripture that, that sin is not what he, what he wants for people, that it, it destroys lives. He wants you to turn from that. And why not do so? And confess the name of Jesus, that he is Lord, that he is the one who has the right to rule. And then let him begin to rule by just submitting to his will. Again, he'd say, Jesus would say, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. That is the command of the king. So if you've not done that, will you do it this evening? And if you've done that at some point in time, but, but maybe you haven't been as committed to the will of the king as you should be, why not render your heart to him? Why not choose that tonight you're going to be devoted, and from this point forward you're going to be devoted to the things that are most important? And if we can help you with that this evening, it's one of the reasons we come together. And we would invite you tonight to come forward as we stand and as we sing. Would you live for Jesus and be always pure and good? Would you walk with him?